We have to give you our usual cautionary uh, statement, which tells you uh, that, amongst uh, anything else, that it's English law if you want to sue us. We are a gold producer. We are a low-cost Russian gold producer. We have four open pit mines. We have 23.3 million ounces of gold in jork resources, of which 9.2 million are reserves. Our processing capacity is 18 million tons a year, and we are targeting a stable production at around half a million ounces of gold a year. We also have a significant investment in an iron ore company also producing gold in the Russian Far East, called IRC, which is listed in Hong Kong. We founded the company in 1984, my Russian partner and I, uh, joined forces, uh, and uh, it was a remarkable journey to, be, to have invested in that country. And the only agreement that he and I have between us is a piece of uh, full scap with uh, a few pencil notes on, and actually we lost it. So we've worked together for 21 years without an argument, without a fight, and uh, it's done very well. We, we listed the company, first of all, uh, in 2002, um, because we had some trophy investors who, we want, who wanted to get out, uh, and the only money we raised was enough to pay the fees of the broker. We moved on later uh, to be uh, listed on a premium listing on the main board and got within an inch of being a FTSE 100 company uh, when the shares were 17 pounds and they're now 5p. So it's been a bizarre ride. But when you look at what we've actually done in terms of production, you can see why people believed in us and I find it harder and harder to understand uh, uh, what actually went wrong. That is a fine uh, a, a production graph uh, and it's interesting to see that we produced 5.5 million ounces of gold. When we started we only had 1 million ounces of, of reserves so we have managed to grow our reserves extremely well. We've done that because we have an effective exploration program. We spend $25 million a year on exploration. And it's, that is the backbone of what we have done in our mining business. We've also invested an enormous amount of money in the production facilities. Uh, and uh, they are of the top quality. Most of the uh, process equipment, as opposed to the mining equipment, comes from China because we're located right on the borders of China. We're working closely with the uh, local government and the federal government in Russia, uh, and recently uh, they've given us a grant to upgrade our overhead power lines to some of our more remote mines, uh, which will give us uh, greater flexibility uh, in our processing. And also they are upgrading the bridges and the road uh, to that, th those two mines up there, which have been a cause of some aggravation when the uh, snow melts you suddenly get a huge sweep of water down which blocks the, the, uh, the access. Key strengths, well, the management team, I would say that, wouldn't I? I'm one of them. But the asset quality is, is very high. We've been, we've been working there for 21 years, working together for 21 years, with a workforce that is extraordinarily well-educated. Um, we're very lucky. Russia has a has a, has a very, very highly educated uh, labor force. I don't know how much you know about the gold mining business, just understand the practical parts of it. Mining, you understand, it's digging holes in the ground, moving, moving waste material and taking out the ore. That gets transported to the process facility, which is it's crushed and, gr uh, and, and grinded. Uh, ground, sorry. <laughs> Uh, uh, to a consistency of flour uh, mixed with cyanide. Cyanide dissolves the gold uh, and then the gold is, re is recovered from the cyanide solution by electrowinning, goes on to the uh, anodes, smelted, and, you, and we pour a doré bar which is roughly 80% gold and 70% silver. 
We have four minds. Uh, if I can find the button. Pokrovsky, Pioneer, Malamir, and Albin. Pokrovsky and Pioneer are quite close together, and Malamir and Albin are quite close together. There's a nasty echo on here, I'm sorry. Um, the Pokrovsky mine, or Pokrovka as it's known in that part of the world, is the first one which we started. And you can see it's a uh, resin in pulp recovery plant. 100%. The original one, Pokrovka, was owned by my partner, and we uh, and I co-invested with him. Uh, the next one, Pioneer, we paid $150,000 for, and it's produced about three million ounces of gold. So it's been a, we were in there at the right time, and we picked up some truly remarkable assets. Um, this um, uh, was virtually unexplored when we got there. It's now quite, not a very big operation, only, only um, 1.8 million tons per annum, um, and uh, is coming to the end of its, end of its life. We're, we're, mi we're mining gold uh, mostly around the um, perimeter, uh, and it's, because it's very close to the railway station, it's where we have built the pressure oxidation uh, hub, where we'll be treating the uh, refractory ore from Malamia. Um, Pioneer is, is, has been the, and is now our flagship mine. It's really uh, extraordinary. I said we paid $150,000 for it in auction from the state, and everybody said, oh, well, the state will hate that. But actually, the state doesn't hate it because it takes a 6% royalty right off the top without any investment, without any management. It goes straight to Mother Russia. We also employ people so in an area where there is very little employment. We pay our taxes locally and federally. Uh, and uh, uh, so from the, from the Russian state's point of view, having someone operate like us operating efficiently is very important. And that's why we're one of 200 companies in Russia that are considered to be strategically important. And we're particularly strategically important because we're right on the borders of China. And the build-up of friendship between Russia and China at the moment particularly in gold, is very strong. Um, we also have, um, we also have, um, I finished that one, um, the uh, Malamir deposit, which is up in the northeast of, of the Amur region where we operate. I just wanted to give you one picture or two pictures of what it looks like in the winter because it's a very different operation. Minus 50. Uh, at the worst in the winter and plus 40 in the summer. Fantastically variable. We have to stop mining at around minus 40 because much below that the steel gets very brittle and can shatter. Um, we acquired this uh, in 2003 when we realized that the future of gold mining worldwide is the treatment of refractory ore. All that is difficult to Liberate, liberate the gold from. The gold is, is, is bound up in, a, in, a, in a, uh, a quartz matrix and you can't get the cyanide through the quartz to do it. However hard, you, however hard you grind it, it doesn't work. Mother Nature, on the other hand, has done a remarkable job over years with oxygen, with air, with wind and sunshine and all the rest of it. So the normal stuff that we're treating has been done over about four million years. What we have to do is the same thing in about 45 minutes in our pressure oxidation, which is uh, crushing and grinding the way we would ordinarily do, and then doing a flotation process. The, the uh, quartz sulfur matrix floats, and you can skim the, the, the scum off the thing and throw all the rest away. Um, and uh, then by mixing that with pure oxygen, the oxygen and the sulfur combined to produce sulfur dioxide uh, and, and, and very high temperatures uh, and, and doing it at very high pressure in a big, what's called an autoclave, a huge pressure cooker, um, we can actually achieve that process and, it, and it's, um, it's, it's working very well uh, on a, on a, on a um, uh, full test bed, not, not in operation yet but, in, but on full test beds and something that is, that is being widely used around the world, um, particularly in uh, Finland, uh, in um, 
Dominican Republic, in New Zealand, so it's a, it's a well-known process, and, but it was expensive to put in. Um, Albin is, the, is our newest mine, also up very close to, uh, uh, to Malamia. Much easier to process or refractory all the way through, no, no, uh, no problems. Um, big stripping ratio because it's, it's, we're going into a hillside, so you have to take a lot of waste material off the top. But, that's, uh, uh, but it's also got a lot of, of uh, other deposits around it which are um, exciting for us in, uh, from an ex 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 exploration point of view. Um, Going forward, though, these are the old mines, what are we going to do in the future? And because we have very high grades, particularly in the uh, uh, Pioneer mine, uh, we decided to look at the idea of going underground. If you have a, a pit uh, like this, pit walls here, as you get to the bottom of it, you have a, you have a it's impossible to, to, to go forward further down unless you move the walls back and that's very very expensive so the idea is to go underground uh, from the bottom of the pit and there's a map here uh, that shows you how that would work the, the big swirls are the, the pit shell and what, where what we've actually done the open pit um, is, is that and then we get by putting a decline in you can drive trucks down to the bottom and mine into the ore body uh, on the side. I'm really sorry, there's so much noise. It's a really deeply inefficient way of doing things. Um, we have uh, several of these zones at Pioneer that we can do the same thing. And I, that is the future of, of, of what we're doing. So the key takeaways, and from, from, from my point of view, is the quality of our assets, focus on cash flow generation, and long-term growth potential. Now, there are, uh, I just want to talk to you a little bit about the gold price, because I think that things that have been going on in the market are very, very, very strange. Gold is, people think of the gold price as what is the London market does every day, the fixing, it's a, it's a, it's a people's mental picture of the gold, of the gold. but the, that's not true. There are, there are now two very, very separate gold markets. There's a physical gold market, which actually is bars, gold that you can hold and touch. And then there's this fantastic uh, derivatives market, particularly in America, around the COMEX. And we are seeing huge demand in the physical market from China, from India, and from the central banks. It's, it's at record levels. China's, China's, China's consumption so far this year is 80% of, uh, of world mine production. China alone, that doesn't count for, for India, which is about another, million, another thousand tons. The demand is, is, is very strong, yet the price is awful. And on Friday we saw another of these great bombing of the market by somebody, nobody knows who, it's happened three or four times recently, Friday was Black Friday. It's the, it's the Friday between Thanksgiving and the weekend when, when there's very few people working in New York. So it had the maximum possible uh, downward effect. And we're seeing things that, that are just a stink of manipulation. And what is going to happen? It, it's very hard to forecast. But if you look at this, the statistics on, on, uh, on the COMEX, which is a futures market, there's about one ounce of gold, deliverable gold, that you could, if you, if you stood for delivery on that market, there is one ounce of gold for every 200 ounces of gold that people have sold. Now, it's relatively easy to buy stuff because there's plenty of money around, but there is very little gold around. And so people who have sold this stuff, I think are taking fantastic risks. And the risk of a the risk of there being trouble on the COMEX, I think, is very high. And that's actually bad news, because so often in this world, 
when there's problem in the market, the, the authorities come in and they say, right, we'll have a financial closeout. And so everybody gets bailed out at uh, some, some uh, amalgam of, 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 a, of a trade weighted average price. Uh, and the shorts uh, are, are let out. But the poor people who need the gold are, are completely lost. And, I, and I, see, I see a real problem here. And so I, I would say to anybody who is in, even thinking about the gold market, um, if you're buying gold because you believe in it as a, as, a, as a safe haven, as a store of value, and as a medium of exchange, because it's nobody else's problem, for goodness sake, buy the physical stuff. Buy, get out there, go, go and buy coins, go and buy small bars, and, and keep them somewhere where you can control them, because the reason to own, own this stuff is exactly that. And I think that the, the risks in the derivatives market, which is now, I think there are something like 450,100-ounce contracts on open interest now, which is, which is a huge uh, amount of gold, um, and, and, and very scary. So, um, I'm happy to try and answer any questions. Um, yes, sir. I, 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 I totally agree with you. So we should sell our petrol shares and buy gold bars? Well, I, I, the, the, there are two reasons for owning gold. One is having what I call running away money. And if I was in Syria right now, uh, I'd be much happier if I had some, some tiny bits of gold to get myself out. That's, that, that's the reason to it. Gold is the last resort. Gold is the, 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 the thing that you hold just in case it's ghastly. I call it wealth insurance. You have health insurance, you have fire insurance, and gold, I think everybody should have some wealth insurance and, and little gold bars. If you want to be involved in a, a, what is, is a leveraged play on gold, all the mining companies are, are leveraged because we have huge amounts of gold in the ground stored, impossible to steal, unless you're a government. Um, uh, then, then, then you're buying you're buying gold very, very cheaply. I mean, the market capitalization of, of our company, the enterprise value of the company is probably a billion dollars. We have 23 million ounces of gold, um, on which we're making 500 bucks an ounce. So, the ultimate value of the company is is huge if you believe in the gold price. And so that's why I think you should buy the company. A lot of people have, have asked me that question, um, and uh, I've never really understood the argument because um, uh, it, it, just because you have a share with a big number in front, it doesn't actually mean it's any better than one with a tiny number. And, and, the, and, and going from a penny uh, to two pennies is, is a 100% uh, increase. So I've never really bought the, the argument, but, but my, um, my eldest son, who is a very big uh, fund manager has already told me, Dad, you know, you should really, you've got to do a share consolidation, so. I'm probably old-fashioned. It's not for, it's not for people, you and I know that the family of that the same as the family of that, but it's for fund managers, they, they're not quite so much. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Yes, sir. Well, all I would say to you is that um, when we take investors to the mines, we always say to the investors, would you like to look at the tailing stamps? And all of them say, oh, no, no, we're not interested in that. After what's happened in Brazil, I think that they should take more care. We take a huge amount of care um, uh, about what we're doing. Um, and, and 
one of the costs of uh, huge costs at Malamere is the lining of the tailings dam uh, with geotextile. Uh, one of my yeah yeah. Um, one of my one of my directors said, for that sort of money, you could you could uh, you could carpet the whole of the Amur region. And I said, well, you, nearly we are, because it we, it, we, we what, what what you have to do in these things is to make them watertight. You can do that effectively with clay or with geotextile, and we, there is no clay. So in order to have a watertight tailings dam, we've had to put geotextile carpets over gigantic areas. Um, but we don't, but we, we're lucky that we're not doing them on big slopes, they're just pile up. So the, the chances of getting a dam burst, I, I can't say that it, it won't happen. Um, it does happen much more often in, in the mining industry than, than people uh, remember. There was, a, there was a bad one at Bayamare in Romania when they put a lot of uh, cyanide into the Danube and killed a lot of fish. Um, uh, and I think the, the, the Brazilian one looks truly terrible. 